my name is Betsy O'Hagan, and I manage web and marketing for Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, a chapter of the National Audubon Society that's located in the greater Cleveland, Ohio area. And today, we're going to be talking with Maurice Small, who is a farming and farm strategist. And Maurice, good morning. How are you today? I bet I'm doing well. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Wonderful. Maurice, good, thank you. Um, we're going to talk about a curriculum that Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society is hosting, uh, and it will be led by uh, Maurice Small. The class is entitled Urban Ag for People, Birds, and Wildlife. Uh, and it is a skills training curriculum that, as I said, that Maurice will lead. And it's open to the public. You do not need to be a member of Audubon. Uh, and we encourage everyone to apply. Uh, Maurice, can you tell us a little bit more about you, uh, who you are, where you're where you're located and where you're based, and more about the great work that you do. Sure. Thanks, Betsy. This is who I am. This is it right here. Roots. 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 These roots produce fruit. I'm all about propagation. I'm all about creating new ways of getting food, not only for humans, but for animals birds, worms, things like that, as a result of the roots that produce the fruit. And by the way, these are thornless black raspberries. And the thornless black raspberry means that you can harvest all you want without getting your fingers pricked. As a result, you can run your hands up and down the raspberry without any thorns. These are going to become four raspberry bushes at one of the farms that I work with. One of my roles in life is to help farmers create more food. One of my roles is also to work with gardeners in the city to help them gain food access. Food access is critical, especially in these times, because you want to know where your food comes from. And where your food comes from is important, because if you know your farmer, you know your food. I help people in the cities and the rural communities, urban, peri-urban, figure out where their food comes from, how to grow their food, how to prepare their food, how to take their soil to a higher level so the soil is super healthy. And I work with cities, governmental agencies, NGOs, hospitals, universities, regular families, mom and pop, single mothers, you name it, everybody. I work with everybody around getting the soil healthy, composting the waste so that there's zero waste in the community, and understanding the importance of roots and the fruits. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, born and raised. I'm currently working in Atlanta, Georgia, USA. And that's me. Thanks, Maurice. That's, that's really great. Tell us some more. Well... There's a few things about working with nature because as a farmer, I'm always out in nature, day and night. And from the moonrise in the early evening to the sunrise in the early morning to the fading of the sun in the evening in the west, there's a special uniqueness that comes from being outside. And being outside means that I'm constantly aware of what's happening. This morning, there was uh, a little woolly bear, the brown and black woolly bear, crawling across the pathway. And I looked at it, picked it up, told it good morning, and let it go on its way. That woolly bear is early. Today is the 19th, I believe, of August. Is that correct, Betsy? Yes. And to see a woolly bear on the 19th of August in Atlanta makes you wonder. So being aware of nature, the butterflies, the woolly bears, what woolly bears eat, what woolly bears turn into, uh, the importance of insects in the ecosystem, the watershed, all these things, one big, one big cycle. That's what I'm constantly aware of, being outside. And being outside is pretty much 
what I thrive on, just being outside. The sun, the rain, the cold, the snow, it doesn't snow much here in Atlanta. However, when I was living and working up in the north, in uh, Kentucky and Ohio and Michigan and Pennsylvania, the snow was there, so we had to prepare different systems for the snow. However, nature was still there, and those little birds, they came through, and they were looking for food. So it depends on how we plant things and what we leave for the birds as far as a food system and a food source, seeds, there's a way that those birds can survive the cold, harsh winter of the north. Here in the south, we just begin to plant and let things go to seed and leave some things going to seed so that over the winter, which is very mild here in Atlanta, we can support our birds because the birds are our friends. The birds do things that we cannot, and we always support nature. Very good. Can you tell us some more about your uh, your work as it applies through the lens of, of Habitat for Birds? Uh, what do you well, think about, about that? I think that the, the lens that I bring and the lens that I share with community as far as birds and our avian partners, the lens is, let's look at the beauty of what they are and what they're able to do. Some birds stay within a 50 mile radius of where they're born and raised. Other birds travel 3,000, 4,000 miles across the world or across mm -hmm. continents in order to secure their offspring's survival. And then the offspring are born someplace else and they fly back when they're strong enough. My role with the birds is to support them by making sure they have enough food on their route to survive the migratory pattern that they are going to face eventually. My role is also to support local birds because local is everything. Think about a morning when you wake up and you give thanks and then you listen and you hear the birds chattering in the morning. That's the most blessed sound just because they're communicating. They're, they're waking up. They're giving honor to the day. Those local birds are important. And the birds that fly through on a migratory pattern are also important because some of those birds will share some of the same things that the local birds share. And it's a wonderful thing seeing birds that are local and migratory birds eating together. And those migratory birds often are there for two or three days, sometimes two weeks, and then, then they're gone. So it's important to have a lens of perspective, local, long distance, and most importantly, a welcoming lens on how birds are important in our environment. Well, as the climate changes and in wherever we are, it's so important to pay much, much more attention to habitat and all that it brings and all that we can provide to birds, as you say, whether they are resident birds or passing through on migration. Especially here, I know uh, in our region, uh, which is an, a birding flyway, a migration flyway. So um, what you will have to teach us, looking through the lens of urban agriculture for all of us, whether it's for people or for birds and other wildlife, is so important. Indeed. Well, thank you, Maurice. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I'd like to add that everything needs food. Everything has a metabolism that cycles into something else. As we as humans consume food, i.e. raspberries or cucumbers or beans or some type of protein, we take that in in order to survive. Birds are no different. Plants are no different. The plants have been here the longest. Therefore, our respect for the plants needs to be paramount. The birds and animals came a little bit later. Our respect for them needs to be paramount. We, as humans, haven't been around that long. We've been here a long time but we haven't been around that long. 
in relation to plants, which I can pull out of the ground, take it, put it in the ground someplace else in a different state, in a different city, in a different country, and it'll grow. Right. We have a tough time doing that. Nature is the most powerful. Nature is able to take a bird twice a year, migrate across continents, entire continents, 3,000, 5,000, 6,000 miles sometimes, and these things are able to have babies and then fly back because their metabolism allows them, and their memory, of course, allows them to find the food sources that they need. We as humans rely on trucks, and we as humans rely on diesel fuel, hopefully one day electric solar power and wind powered fuel to get our food to a warehouse somewhere that comes to a supermarket somewhere that allows us to go and purchase that food. Some of us grow our own food nearby on a farm in our backyards, on our patios, and things like that. As a result, we can control and know where our food is. However, if you're relying on the general population of just want to come in a truck, go to a warehouse, I'll be able to go shopping and get whatever I want, Birds don't have that luxury. We've taken our environmental systems almost to the point of exhaustion. And as a result, we're suffering, the earth is suffering, and our partners, the birds, and the insects are also suffering. My goal is to take us back into nature, looking at a specific touch point in nature so that we can begin to look at the importance of how we fit, how we can change, and how we are responsible to put back certain food systems in an urban environment, in a rural environment, and a peri-urban environment, so that not only we survive well and healthy, but our partners, the insects, and the birds can survive as well. We have to look at the simpleness, and we have to look at the responsibility. We as humans with these huge brains have gone awry sometimes and not thought about the long term. Nature isn't like that. Mm -hmm. I'd like us to explore nature in our backyards, on our patios, on our bird walks, and I'd like us to look at how we can best support other things, which in turn will support us. That's what I got, Betsy. That's wonderful. I'm so excited to think that uh, many of us can accompany you on a journey of getting closer to nature over a 12-week period. <laughs> I mean, that's so exciting. So Indeed. Can, can you tell me just a little bit more about, as, as our guide, what, what will we expect to learn with you? as we go on this 12-week journey, and how, how, will you, how will that work? Well, what we're going to learn is we're going to learn about ourselves, and we're going to learn about our closest environments, where we live, where we walk, where we ride our bikes. We're going to avoid the car thing. We're going to just look at something local, like 10 miles around where we are and how we can affect change within a 10-mile radius of where we are. Most people that ride a bike don't ride a bike beyond 10 miles. So five miles out, five miles back, whew, I'm tired. I'm going to go home and drink some water and have some food. Most people ride a bike two or three miles and do the same thing. Walking, we might walk two miles, maybe three, a mile and a half out, a mile and a half back. And some of us that are going to be coming into the learning group will be coming from the perspective of kilometers and meters. So I want to be able to acknowledge you all as well. Certain times in our lives, we get focused on things, and we often forget about where we're coming from. So bringing us back into the local range of where we live, where we work, how we work, what we work with, that's my goal. And I want to be able to help you all look at each other Look yeah. at who we are as a group because it's not mm -hmm. just you and I talking right. about birds. It's you and I and Jonathan and Susie and Malik and uh, Yohosa working towards a collective 
entity of we are going to work together. We are going to learn from each other and with each other. I want to make sure that we can, as responsible people, learn. And I'm looking forward to learning from each of you, not just you all learning from me. That is, that is not the way. There's so much activity. There's so much joy when it comes to sharing. The birds talk in the morning because they're sharing about their dreams. <laughs> they're sharing about where that insect source was. They're sharing about, you know, where the fresh water was. They're sharing about, don't go over there. There's that wild cat. And she, she got jo Joseph yesterday. I don't <laughs> want anybody else to get by that wild cat. So the birds communicate. You might hear them in the background. And the birds are very responsible. And they're so beautiful. And I feel that we can be the same. We can be responsible. We can be beautiful. We can share. And the birds, as you know, are able to plant. They don't plant on purpose. They just plant randomly, I believe. When they eat that raspberry seed, that raspberry seed has a coating on it. And when they eat those uh, bean seeds, those bean seeds have a coating on it. In the gut, everything has a gut. Worms have a gut, goats have a gut, birds have a gut, we have a gut. Elephants have a gut, giraffes have a gut. They all have, fish have guts. In that gut is the base of who we are as living creatures. That gut holds the RNA and the DNA of who we are as living creatures. And in the bird's gut in particular, they are able to remove that seed coating and when they have their bowel movement wherever on top of the, the greenhouse on your balcony on the fence line that seed passes through their system sometimes whole and that seed drops that coating and the plants are very wise because they put a self-protective coating on it that seed drops down without that coating and let me get something real quick. Whoops. The marvelousness of soil and healthy soil is that once that uncoated seed gets into the soil, that seed then begins to germinate. One moment. So let's use our imagination. And our imagination is going to tell us that there's two different plants here. And, well, actually three different plants. That bird was up here about two and a half weeks ago. And that bird had a bowel movement. That bowel movement was very runny because birds don't have thick bowel movements like humans or some animals. And that bowel movement brought that seed down. And that seed landed in healthy soil. And what happened with that from there was that seed was able to germinate and that seed was able to take all of its naturalness, put roots down and put leaves out. What happened next was, and I'm going to pull this little seedling out, what happened next was that little seed began to grow. And as it began to grow, things began to take place. Photosynthesis. That little seed becomes the apple tree. That little seed becomes the raspberry bush. That little seed becomes that jack in the beanstalk bean that travels all over the place. That little seed passed through that bird randomly the native tribes, as we know, were able to walk this land here in the USA for thousands of years without harming anything. The result was the birds were here thousands and millions of years prior to them, the native people, coming and walking these lands. So there was already plenty of fruit. There was already plenty of root crops. There was already plenty of everything. Thanks to the birds, 
thanks to the squirrels, thanks to the chipmunks, thanks to things, nature, animals, and plants that were already here. I'd like us to explore how we, with our large minds, can rehabilitate our urban and our rural and our peri-urban environments so that we can begin to feed ourselves and, most importantly, feed the natural systems around us. How's that, Betsy? <laughs> That's wonderful, Maurice. I'm very excited um, to be a part of this community. <laughs> I am, too. I love seeds and seedlings and birds and worms. <laughs> Well, Any final questions? I think that's good for now, but I know we'll have some more very soon. But thank Wonderful. you so much for your time and helping us to, to get started um, paying attention to the work that you do and how, how we need to be responsible to help carry that out wherever we are. Thank Indeed. you, Marie. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. We'll talk again soon. Truthfully. <laughs>